Good morning. Happy Wednesday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. Okay. Well, Wednesday, always a tight day for me. Got a lot of stuff that I do Wednesday mornings. And so we got to cut to the chase. Um, I was playing on the YouTube channel this morning and there was a, a series of questions that I thought would be, be very useful if we go over. So I'm going to try to do three sort of short questions versus one long question uh, today. So the first one comes from Stephen. Stephen says, is the loss of pronation often accompanied or even driven by the loss of internal rotation? So he's referring to internal rotation of the shoulder. Yes and no. So let's look at this thing. So if we think about the constraints of the elbow, if I drive the humerus into external rotation far enough, eventually I'm going to hit the constraints of the elbow and I'm going to follow with the forearm. So I'll have ER of the humerus, I will have supination at the forearm which will steal my pronation. But in many cases when we have the extreme external rotation, so we see this in, in, in throwers and such, where um, they still have to get their hand into a useful position. So just imagine trying to keyboard with an ER and supinated forearm and trying to get your hand back to, back to the keyboard. Um, what, what you'll end up seeing is you'll see this ER and they'll have maxed out their pronation, but they will still be in pronation deficit when we measure it by standard measures. Um, and so we have, to, we have to keep our eyes out for that because in that situation, we'll typically see a tremendous amount of medial elbow stress. So essentially what happens is, especially with throwers, that they're, as they're coming through the, the throwing motion, the humerus stays in ER, the forearm is in, is in ER, and we get relative ER, and we get a lot of medial elbow stress. So um, that's a really good question, Stephen, very, very useful. So what you want to make sure that under those circumstances is that you recapture the shoulder IR and restore that, that full pronation capability. So again, that'll be very protective for those uh, throwers with elbow issues. Uh, question number two comes from Ashwani. And Ashwani says, what causes limited hip internal rotation bilaterally for wide ISA person. Okay, we've talked about this before, but it's worth worth going over again because some of these things get, get really confusing and then we've got layers of compensatory strategy to talk about. So if we're going to talk about a wide ISA, so we've got We've got a wide IPA to go with it. We've got nutation of the sacrum, so we've got an expansion in this posterior lower aspect. So under these circumstances, this would antivert the, the acetabulum, which would give us plenty of IR. However, because of the expansion posteriorly, we've got a center of gravity issue that's gonna knock me backwards. And so my first strategy from our wide ISA is to create that compressor strategy in, uh, near the base of the sacrum. So I'm gonna push the top of the pelvis forward which is going to take me in that direction. And so now I have a center of gravity issue that's going to push me forward. So I will compress from the front side under those circumstances. So I'll compress the front side of the pelvis. I get a shape change in the, in the ischium, which picks up the external rotation concentric orientation. And so I, right away I start to lose my IR capabilities. Now, very, very late in these compensatory strategies, I got to think about posterior lower. So when this initiates its concentric orientation very, very late, where I'm going to bring the sacrum, uh, I'm going to bend that sacrum underneath, that will also pick up some of that, that ER concentric orientation, at least initially until we get another shape change in the pelvis. And so late in the compensatory strategy, I'm going to lose some, some IR under those circumstances. So there's a couple of ways that we can influence this. And it just depends on how far and, and how, how deep into these compensatory strategies we actually are. But again, another really good question. Question number three, um, maybe one of the best names ever um, on, on YouTube, Hawk Z. Um, so he was looking at the performance video from earlier uh, this week, and he had a really good question about re-implementation of some of these bilateral symmetrical exercises. So he's talking about push-ups and chin-ups. It's like, are these going to drive us right back into our compensatory strategies? And potentially I would say yes. And so this is one of the things that we have to be really, really careful of as we start to bring people back into 
full training mode. So we we have these issues with our athletes where they may come in with these really aggressive compensatory strategies because they they always perform under high force and high speed, and you have to have those strategies available to you. But when they start walking around with them and they start to lose some of the the, the movement capabilities that they need to be comfortable and to be healthy, then we have we have concerns. <clears throat> However. We want to restore, especially like return to play issues or late off season where we're really trying to drive up force production to prepare them for the season, we have to implement these activities. So one of the things that, that I like to do, especially when we're starting to restore these bilateral symmetrical activities to the programming, is to start with activities that reduce the, the influence of, of that posterior compressive strategy especially. So when you think about like a back squat and the scapular retraction that's required there, you're gonna close off that dorsal rostral. We're gonna lose, we're gonna lose some, some rotation in the shoulder. We're gonna potentially compress that posterior pelvis. And, and again, so we're gonna lose some of those, those movement capabilities. But if we implement something like say a front squat, where we can maintain the yielding strategy, now we've, we've actually um, reduced the, the influence that would restrict our ability to turn, especially which, which is important for a change of direction type of things. Um, that a lot of our, our field and core athletes um, have to deal with. Um, I like snatch grip RDLs to, to reinitiate hinging activities because moving the arms away from the sides actually moves us from, from a more IR position to a little bit more ER. So again, I get some, some of that posterior expansion. And so there are activities that we can utilize that will help maintain our ability to, to yield posteriorly, especially what that we need that we need for turning. Um, another strategy in this regard is when we know that we're going to have to utilize an activity that is very high compression. So think about power cleans and, and again, back squats, pulls from the floor, anything along those lines is gonna be a, a very compressive type activity. What we might do is we might make that primary uh, exercise for that day, um, A number one, and then everything after that is structured so that we start to restore some of these, these movement capabilities. So think about the highest possible intensity, highest force output, highest speed activity coming first because we have to use these compensatory compressive strategies um, for that, that type of force production. And then, like I said, we, we construct the rest of the program to help them maintain many of their, their movement capabilities. So uh, Hawk Z, and again, great name. I appreciate you. Thanks for the question, guys, on YouTube. Keep them coming. Check out the YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Oh, co uh, coffee and coaches call in the morning, 6 a.m. Please join us. I will see you then.